are you buying real estate in an area where the transformation of that market is understood? And I think a lot of property investors struggle at this one. They often buy real estate uh, as property investors in places they're not 100% familiar with. And as time goes on, they even start to really struggle as to, you know, what the purpose of that marketplace uh, ultimately is. Welcome to the Urban Property Investor. I'm your host, Sam Saggers, here to help you crack the code of real estate wealth. Today's show, another code cracking affair. We're going to dig into how to build a really sustainable portfolio. How do we know we're on the right track? It's a big question when it comes to property investing. I think there are a few little signals which I want to share today which can remind you if you're holding real estate, if you've already gone to the trouble to buy properties, where your properties fit in the ecosystem, which is the real estate marketplace and the real estate industry. And if you're potentially buying real estate, what to look out for when it comes to ticking the boxes so you know you're on the right track when it comes to choosing the right real estate to buy when it comes to building a scalable buy and hold portfolio. So I tell you what, there's a lot to dig in today. I think you're going to have to allow about 45 to 55 minutes for this episode. So you know what that means, play it in double speed. So potentially you can just circle back to another cool episode of The Urban Property Investor or maybe duck off and listen to some more real estate news from my business partner, Jason Witten, over at the Wealth Faculty. He's still got some great podcasts up there as well, which are worth reviewing and listening to from some of the greats in the industry, some of the greats when it comes to the idea of psychology and wealth. Hey, I am pumped to deliver today's show, and I am dressed like my favorite little friend, the Gopnik. Yes, I'm wearing my Gopnik outfit because I'm actually celebrating Gopnik news. Yes, I have gone out and purchased myself a Gopnik mini midget dog. Yes, I can't believe it. I'm so excited. In fact, it's a little bit impromptu impromptu. Uh, This morning I woke up and I found a little dog which was uh, melting my heart and I decided that's it. I'm buying him. So Raffi is now my dog. He actually lives in Brisbane and he's going to get her an aeroplane. Yes, Raffi is is, uh, traveling by air to come and see me and he is a little Gopnik dog. Uh, I figured... If I'm going to talk about Gopniks, I'm going to get myself a Gopnik dog. And I've uh, put myself down for a little mini bull terrier. Yes, he's about 30 centimeters tall. Of course, Gopniks love bull terriers, don't they? They kind of walk around with Adidas tracksuit pants on with scary looking bull terriers. So I decided to do the same thing. I'm now wearing Adidas clothing and I'm going to have a mini bull terrier. But no, uh, mini bull terriers are said to be a top 10 family friendly dog in Australia. They are lovable. They are not dangerous. They look a little bit savage, but uh, don't we all? I tell you what. So I'm pumped uh, this morning, um, ticking the box of getting myself a new little friend, man's best mate has, uh, yeah, lit me up, so to speak. And of course, anyone who's a longtime listener of the show would know that uh, about five months ago, lost my dearest friend, Hannah the dog. Uh, She passed away, sadly, of old age. And uh, it's, yeah, it's been on my mind to, to get a new dog when I was ready. And Rafi just really did stand out from the crowd. He's already about one year of age and no one wants Raffi because he's one year old. I decided I'll take a Gopnik dog that's one year of age and uh, let him be part of my family and I'm super pumped. 
Hey, I tell you what, we're not here to talk about my love affair with Gopniks and midget Gopnik dogs. We're here to talk about whether your property portfolio is going in the right direction because quite often what happens as we own real estate or even buy real estate, we often go into a little bit of regret theory that we kind of perhaps, you know, second guess our decisions and really uh, start to question where we belong in this world. And of course, you know, quite often with real estate, the grass is always greener. There's always someone who's doing better than yourself in life. And it quite often puts a lot of social pressure on you and the performance of all the things you've gone out and done. I get it. It certainly happens to all of us inside society. The idea here in a capitalist country is people who uh, perform better in a capitalist country often get all the accolades and so forth. So the reality is we are in a competitive landscape when it comes to economics and the real estate market is no different. But I will say there are so many different markets inside markets in real estate. And I really wanted today's show to just cover off the idea of asset allocation inside the real estate marketplace, as well as just remind people really the types of real estate marketplaces inside of Australia do vary and the performance inside those marketplaces do vary. Some do very, very well in a marketplace which we're in at the moment, which is full of uh, social and spatial change. Other real estate markets may be sitting on the fence right now, but does it mean they're bad places to own real estate? Well, not at all. Things moved at different speeds inside the real estate marketplace. I often teach that real estate booms can be bottom up. In other words, the less expensive properties are growing the fastest, or it can be a top-down real estate market boom where prestige real estate is leading the charge. Really, today, uh, we are now seeing a shift really with some of the more A-grade real estate in the marketplace leading the charge when it comes to capital growth. And of course, much of that real estate is in the discretionary or prestige marketplace, which is kind of distorting some of the growth figures which are occurring across our cities. When a $5 million property sells for $9 million, it certainly creates a huge amount of capital growth, which again, sometimes distorts what's happening for the more uh, average properties in the marketplace. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to dig into some of the facts and figures around real estate. And of course, some of the ideas around just comprehending if we're on the right track or not. So I think it's going to be a great show. Um, again, maybe push me in double speed if you like. Um, and hopefully we can uh, wind up with some more information within this space of an hour on this podcast. Now, I'll tell you what, when it comes to people owning real estate as investors, some interesting statistics the Australian Bureau of Statistics captures. And of course, we've almost got a new census due out. So uh, we will get some more data. But back in 2016, when this particular data was captured, uh, 71% of property investors owned one piece of real estate. That is around 1.5 million Australians today own an investment property as just a single investment. Now, that's not people buying their own home. And I certainly think buying your own home as a property investment strategy is a good one as well, because, you know, for the most part, it can give you some advantages as to where you buy real estate. And of course, uh, some of the capital gains advantages of owning your own home are second to none in the real estate marketplace. But a lot of Australians never end up on a in a situation where they own really income producing real estate and their own home. That is obviously the biggest battle for Australians today is to kind of win at this thing called the real estate market by creating a great home, but also multiple investments. When we look at the statistics, it's easy to see what is going on because only 1.5 million Australians own one investment property, which is really arguably not enough to end up on a huge amount of passive income. 
The numbers uh, start to even diminish further when it comes to two investment properties. It's around 407,000 people, according to the ABS, own two investment properties or 19% of all property investors. Three properties diminishes further, 125,000 people or 6% of all property investors. And by the time we get to five property investments under someone's, I guess, ownership structure, it really is only 19,504 people or 1% of all property investors get to this place called the 1% Club. And of course, it's a big thing I love coaching people to get to, but of course, uh, quite often things come along and uh, test your mindset when it comes to ending up with five or more properties or being part of the 1% club. And I think when market booms come along, it really does make us analyze what we own, uh, where we're going in life, is real estate even working for us? And if we are in a position to capitalize on what is unfolding. Obviously, markets uh, you know, boom and bust all the time in the real estate marketplace. And so quite often we need to just have a bit of a sensibility check if we're actually building something that's scalable and important over the long term. In the short term, real estate can be a little bit vol volatile. It can go down, it can go up, it can go sideways. But over the long term is really the point of real estate and so I love to help scale portfolios. And I think really it is broken down into three sections. Really your professional and personal goals in life, what you're trying to achieve and when you want to achieve those goals by and of course the point in time you want to activate buying real estate. Obviously there is a, a theory in real estate that sometimes it's better not even to buy real estate at all because of the market cycle. But then you have to weigh that up against someone's ability to actually get a loan. Can people enter the market perfectly all the time at the right time to ride the boom? Well, one would argue, you know, the challenge is we aren't getting any younger. Tomorrow you're going to be older than today. And if you can get a property loan today, it is probably the best time to buy because you never know what is going to occur a year from now. A year from now, just hypothetically, interest rates could be more expensive so your buying power could drop. You could start a family and have twins and all of a sudden you've got two dependents and your buying power will drop. So one of the things with real estate in building a scalable portfolio, the first rule is there is never a perfect time. Uh, and really, you just have to take that on the chin and make a decision to move into the real estate marketplace based on your financial situation, not necessarily the market situation. And that is really one of the things that nicks people in the head about the real estate marketplace. Probably the most I see is when we often don't get to enter the market when there is a boom and we've been waiting for a period of time for that market growth to come along, uh, sometimes, you know, we start to second guess the assets we own, what it is that is unfolding. And the reason we do that is because the moment we were able to get into the market, maybe it was a little bit of a different marketplace. But I still think sometimes when the market is really soft, it is such a good time to buy because you just get so much more availability of opportunity. Uh, I guess to build a scalable portfolio, you also need a good set level of real estate which can provide growth and a good level of real estate that can provide cash flow and debt reduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about the idea of knowing we're going in the right direction. I think the first conversation around going in the right direction with what we may own or what we may buy is the ability to afford the property in the beginning. Uh, the reality is uh, if uh, you're extending yourself too much with real estate and you're buying real estate 
which has an unequal mathematical equation, it just becomes so hard to scale more real estate around it. So I often see this, you know, people make big mistakes with real estate when they go too negatively geared. They bite off real estate uh, and they just simply cannot service any more debt because the property they choose to buy just has no gearing benefits to it. It is not cash flow positive. And in a marketplace like this, it is so important and critical to make sure that we have rents that really cover the line share of what we do. Now, when it comes to the ability to afford real estate, knowing you're in, going in the right direction, I think it's really critical to understand inflation. Uh, you want real estate that can handle inflation. And by th- what I mean by that is quite often, you know, today in bullish marketplaces, people are buying blunders that if there was to be an interest rate rise, they would be unable to really pass that interest rate rise on to their tenants. Now, tenants have a profile too, and it is something that many property investors fail to comprehend, that when interest rates rise, usually you have an opportunity to pass that rise on to your tenant marketplace. But as we know, we now live in a mega trend marketplace where inequality is one of the biggest mega trends in the world. So for me, one of the first rules of investing is making sure you can afford it, making sure you can afford inflation, and making sure you've got a rental growth plan. So if inflation comes, you can pass on that cost to very skillful tenants who can afford to help contribute for that transformation. So I think this is so critical. This is kind of like a defense strategy when it comes to buying and holding real estate, but it is a critical strategy for long-term investing. Obviously, I think it's important to have a bit of a growth plan, and I'm going to talk about the different dimensions of growth inside the real estate marketplace because not every property is created equally and certainly not every buyer is created equally either. So it is a big conversation piece, the idea of growth, which I'll circle back to, I think, later in this conversation. Obviously, there are some ideas which I often teach when it comes to the big four with real estate. The market itself, are you buying real estate in an area where the transformation of that market is understood? And I think a lot of property investors struggle at this one. They often buy real estate uh, as property investors in places they're not 100% familiar with. And as time goes on, they even start to really struggle as to you know, what the purpose of that marketplace uh, ultimately is. And again, I think this is the one of the most critical things to understand is market risk. Uh, I'm going to share with you a little bit of insights around how markets work. And so you can start to perhaps understand a little bit more about your own real estate. Obviously, there are other risks which I teach openly on this podcast, operational risks, the cost to run real estate, liquidity risk, the ability to sell real estate, and insurance risks, the ability to own real estate in risk-free suburbs, locations, which are not exposed to things like floods or bushfires or other, you know, green swan events, which typically arise at the moment in a mega trend economy of climate change. So the risk profile of real estate is probably the biggest comprehension, I think, which makes really good long-term investment. Again, if you are going in the right direction, you will have ticked off market risk, operational risk, insurance risk, and liquidity risk. And again, I think it's so important to understand market risk is inflation. And right now, we are at the lowest possible point ever in the history of real estate may never get cheaper than what it is today to own real estate. So we're going to talk a little bit about what if real estate was to become more costly to own, 
where and how do we know we're going in the right direction so we can defend ourselves if there was to be an inflationary movement in the real estate economy. Now, I also think to understand if you're going in the right direction, that it is a good idea to study some of the masters in economics. And probably the best investor in the world, of course, is the famous Warren Buffett. He fundamentally is a share market investor, but I do like what he has to say when it comes to the philosophy of investment and some of the principles he works within. I mean, he openly says, don't deal with dimwits when it comes to investments. Understand talented people with integrity will help you get where you need to go. So don't be the clickbait. I think, honestly, um, you'll be served based on how algorithms work at the moment, just about anything that you're thinking about. So if you start thinking in a strange direction, you're probably going to get served some of those dynamics around the grass is always greener. And a lot of that is just merely clickbait. It is not real. It is not uh, it is be a fundamentally a money illusion. And I see just so many people suffering this thing around a money illusion. The grass is always greener somewhere else. Uh, and that is something that a lot of property investors fall prey to. And it is not necessarily so. I think the grass is greener where you water it most. And let's face it, if we can water what we have the most, we're going to end up in the right direction. Obviously, I think today in this economy, and it is one of Warren Buffett's principles, you know, invest in facts, not some sort of emotional gut feeling that you have around real estate. Be actually factual. Are there megatrends? Fact. Yes, there are. Is the world and future different to what it was within real estate? Yes, it is. Is there inequality in the real estate market? Fact, there is. Are people struggling from a cash flow point of view in certain socioeconomic zones of Australia? Yes, factual. It is very, very true. So all of a sudden, you know, just choosing real estate or holding real estate in unproductive economic areas, which had once been successful property marketplaces, does not guarantee that they are going to be future successful property marketplaces. I think this is a critical point, and I like what Warren Buffett has to say here. You know, suburbs that have performed in the past within the Australian property market aren't necessarily the same suburbs which will perform in the future. And I say that because, you know, we have seen real estate uh, climb in value and the cost to run real estate climb in value and wages stagnate. We've never seen that before inside of real estate. We've never had this kind of big challenge in the context that today some real estate is really going up based on the rates going down, not because the people or place which that real estate is in is improving. And those marketplaces, I think, are a really good example of what to not to buy inside the real estate market dynamic. Buy good real estate, not cigarette butts. It's one of Warren Buffett's saying. Um, and it it really is a, a, such an important statement. You know, he obviously says buy good shares, not cigarette butts, not penny stocks. The reality is the same thing applies to the real estate market, right? We want some good real estate, but how do we know it's good? How do we know it's right? And this is what I want to sort of go into as we drift through this podcast. And of course, uh, if you do get it right, the old saying, buy well, never sell, will come into context. Holy cow, someone's buzzing my front door. What do I do? Uh, hang on a sec. This has never happened. This is unprecedented. I don't know. I hope the team can cut this out. I'm going to... Uh, just stick my head out the window. Wait one sec. Hey! How can I help you? There is no building inspection here. The... 
oh, that's around the corner. No, my wife isn't, Janelle. All right, yeah, just keep going around the corner. That's the lane way. All right, have a great day. Hello again. Um, yes, so where was I? I tell you what, uh, this area, I, I know what's going on. I know what just happened. I know why my door just buzzed. I, don't, I wasn't expecting anyone. The buzz. My neighbor must be selling. Why would they be getting a building report done? This, I think they're doing an off-market transaction. Jeez, everyone's bloody cashing in on this market. It is, uh, it is going gangbusters. But I tell you what, there's so much action in the street, and I, I'm, I'm struggling to keep up. You know, just what I found out two days ago was the house next door to me is getting bulldozed. So now I'm not only dealing with the Gospodar who constantly mows his lawns across the street and now I've got the Gopnik dog, I am now going to suffer the consequences of people rebuilding in my street. And of course, this knockdown rebuild marketplace, again, just gives so much context that people absolutely... Uh, will invest in a marketplace if they see value in it. And it's no dissimilar to, to really my next door neighbor. Like the reality was there was nothing wrong with that property. And now I've heard they're going to knock it over and build an um, absolute killer mansion. And of course, you know, overcapitalized. But in some respects, this is the sign of something which is really, really important for property investors to understand. We call this social status. Yes, social status. My social status as a Gopnik dog owner has just dropped. But that's okay. I'm comfortable in my own skin. But when we think about real estate marketplaces and knowing if we're going in the right direction, I think it is really a good little checklist just to consider social status. And what I mean by that is if you can find a real estate marketplace or you own or hold real estate in a marketplace where there is going to be a future change in status, you're absolutely going to get, you know, growth over time and of course, end up in this place called financial freedom. You know, people will pay more for an area if they believe it's underpriced. And we often see this whereby a new social status discovers a suburb and comes in and goes, you know what? This is really inexpensive. I love it. Um, it is just what I'm looking for as a place to live in. I'm going to pay more because I want to get my hands on real estate in this marketplace. Social status is a big driver as to whether you know you own real estate in the right direction. Now, I often see, I guess, people buying investments in areas where the social status is never going to change. There is no way that a better social class wants to move to an area which is almost labeled a, you know, a dud area, a low socioeconomic zone, an area where there's lots of crime. It's just uh, not going to happen. It may happen 40 years from now, but when it comes to knowing we're going in the right direction, I think it's critically important to understand that we might be able to buy a diamond in the rough and an emerging marketplace, which I'll talk about a little bit later, where we're betting on social status change, which is perfectly fine. Like the grassroots gentrification movement of suburbs is a critical way to find a independent or secular marketplace to invest in. But uh, we want to know that it is going to absolutely unfold. We don't want to bet on an ugly duckling, which is a real ugly, ugly duckling that has no chance of improvement. So we want uh, to invest in this thing called social status change. If we know we've got real estate in a suburb where people think quite uh, well of that place, over time, it is just going to continue to become more valuable because real estate works on the principle there are more people, 
then there is possibly good places to ever have uh, real estate in. And really, when you think about Australia's business plan, it is all about the idea of more people, less places. And of course, what that means is more people coming into the the overall economy over measured over time. I know with coronavirus, you know, we've got a temporary pause on things. But what will happen when the borders open and no real estate has been built and hundreds of thousands of people love brand Australia, all of a sudden we're going to see a bit of a squeeze again, one would consider, particularly probably in the rental market to begin with, where uh, all those new people coming back to Australia are going to need somewhere to live. Really, right now, it's fair to say that for the most part, we are running out of stock. Um, And that is an interesting future dynamic I'm excited about inside the real estate market. Probably a 2023 kind of dynamic, but one which is going to be exciting nonetheless. Now, how do we know we're in the right direction? I think it's a a great way to control your emotions using data. I'm a big believer in using research sites just to have a practical conversation with yourself. I mean, quite often, again, if we're choosing the right property, we should use research sites. If we're holding real estate, we should use research sites and just take a little bit of context into consideration. Now, for me, probably the best research site is RP Data Core Logic. This is a subscription service. Most property investors don't consider themselves professional investors, so they don't spend to have access to Core Logic. I'll let you be the decision maker there. If you're if you're taking this stuff seriously, you'd get a tax deductible account to Core Logic. If you're not, um, you know, you'll you'll you need to be part of a team that can give you access to it. Otherwise, um, again, you're, you're probably just not analyzing the real estate market as thoroughly as you should to make sure you're going in the right direction. CoreLogic's reports will give you access to, you know, what the uh, most expensive dress circle sale has been in your neighborhood, what properties are selling for, the discount rate of real estate in your neighborhood, comparable sales of real estate in your neighborhood. So you can really understand what is going on and you can obviously then go and apply a volatility rate against what is occurring. And it really is common in real estate to have a volatility index of around 10%. The government allows for that on any uh, particular day of sale. The price can exceed the purchase price by 10% or actually be under the purchase price by 10% and is considered a fair volatility rate. CoreLogic um, gives some great insights into comparable real estate. You can start to map out what potentially is going on in your neighborhood. You can work out potentially, you know, two or three streets away uh, in a better position. Real estate is selling for X and determine, well, maybe the ripple will come to my real estate and it will eventually, you know, move in the right direction. And again, I think using some of these research sites gives a little bit more context as to what what is going on. In any particular suburb, there are better streets. Real estate is at a niche level really, uh, you know, different. And quite often, again, I think property investors sort of have this overall macro view of a suburb where it's like, well, I bought in that suburb, the median price is this. Well, half of that suburb, uh, you know, is on the wrong side of the tracks and the other half is on the right side of the tracks and in that half on the right side of the tracks, there's even, even more quality streets. So again, I think it's really important because you can start to map out the best real estate in the market Um, you know, the properties which fetch the most, the streets that actually do the best and start to work out, well, maybe um, if you're not going to buy in the best street, you could be three streets behind the best street. So all of a sudden, I think, you know, a lot of property investors just don't pay for the research. I'm a big believer of Cordell's. Cordell's tells me how much development is going to occur in an area and what the DAs are. And you can look at Cordell's and it will give you a result 
Obviously, if you look on one day and then look a month later, it can change because a new DA can be lodged, but you can set up notifications and start to comprehend what is going on in your area. And if there was something that came along that was significantly going to move the market in the wrong direction, you can make business decisions around what that means as a professional property investor. Quite often, we see some suburbs get a little bit of development. And that's not such a bad thing because often we see the inflation rate of certain development pushing prices up. Again, the guy next door is going to build a new home. It's going to be worth more than his old home. The sheer fact he's doing a development is not changing my market landscape. It is actually improving my market landscape because that home, once complete, is going to be worth more and it is now a direct comparable next door to my home. As such, it will lift the overall appeal of the street. And we often call this, you know, um, the benchmark in real estate. What we're looking for is almost like benchmark new developments that are going to improve the market landscape. And quite often, I think there is this kind of unfound fear that new stock is going to ruin a market landscape. And look, in really high density precincts where there is, uh, you know, where, you know, really, you know, you would argue why is density even going to this suburban area makes a lot of sense. Owning Cordell's could tell you to clear out from that marketplace. But in most areas, um, you know, a little bit of development is actually a good thing for property investors. So I like these kind of research sites. I know I've spoken about a few others like SQM and Microburbs and WalkScore. They're all very good. I love Microburbs because it can tell me where the affluence or the social status of real estate is at its best. Then I can look next door and see if there's an opportunity to buy uh, possible transformation of social status. And again, I, I think just understanding, you know, the investment principles around this is it's really key to holding good real estate for a long period of time. You know, there are, you know, probably about 10,000 plus suburbs in Australia. Now think about it that way. You might own real estate in a suburb that's got really good social status and, you know, you're leaps and bounds ahead of, you know, so much real estate out there, which is just struggle street real estate marketplaces. So I think to understand if we're on the right direction, you know, understanding the yields today are very, very important, very important, just for context. Now, back in 2007, uh, Sydney was throwing out in a good blue chip pocket of Sydney, about a 6% return. I was buying real estate five kilometers to the center of city, of the city of Sydney, of the CBD. Uh, it was a 6% yield. Now, that sounds impressive, doesn't it? Because today that yield uh, on brand, you know, a, a new deal at the price point that stock is five kilometers to the CBD would be more like a 2% yield. I bought it a 6% yield. It's now a 2% yield. The reason is the real estate's gone up in value in those precincts. So, but here's the thing. When I was buying real estate at a 6% yield, I was actually borrowing money at an 8% uh, interest rate in Sydney in 2007. 8%. Today, the interest rate or cash rate is a tenth of 1%. I was borrowing uh, you know, you can get a home loan today at 3%, right? Back in 2007, you could get a home loan for 8%. So quite often, you know, we need to understand that what we're investing in is the spread. And obviously in 2007, you know, the spread was very negative. It meant that to own real estate, you need to prop it up with your own income. The spread back then, borrow money at eight, rent it at six, you pay the difference. We're now in a different marketplace where the spread is completely different. The reason I talk about spread is I think 
talking about yield is not necessarily the right conversation in this particular low rate environment. If we were to analyze yields, what is a low yield, medium yield, and high yield? I am going to give you my formula based on today. Now, five years from now, this will probably change again. And again, we want to invest in real estate with a good spread to, because we now need to factor in possible inflation into the future because when rates are this low, the, really there is only one direction they can go, which is eventually back up. Do I think that's going to happen tomorrow? No, I don't. So a gross yield is just basically a yield before you factor in your costs to then uh, create a net yield. But we're going to work off gross yields today. So for me, if you're borrowing money at 3% and you are getting under 3% as a gross yield, you are fundamentally getting a very low return or low yield today. And again, there is no spread or buffer for you to maneuver. So I'm seeing a lot of property investors today who are particularly buying at the moment, buying yields below 3%. I would suggest that that is, carries risk, carries a, a, a fair amount of risk. The reason is, obviously, if interest rates go up, let's say your yield is at 3% and all of a sudden you're paying 4% for an interest um, rate on a property which is today double what it was 10 years ago, again, your risk buffer is a little bit out of kilter. So how do we know we're going in the right direction in today's economy? I think the fact you can borrow money at 3%, if you can rent properties above 3 closer to 4%, you're getting a very good medium level base yield. Again, the fact that you're getting a gross yield of potentially close to 4% means you've got a buffer there for inflation. And quite often when governments move interest rates, they do it at a 0.25% level, meaning potentially you've got a good buffer there for at least four movements in the cash rate should it happen based on your yield conversion. Your spread is pretty good if you're getting close to 4% today yield. And again, I think this is just a good way to remind people if they're going in the right direction, go and analyze your gross yield. Where are you compared to the real cash rate today and what money is being sold for? Obviously, in that example, you're, um, you're uh, borrowing money at 3%. You're renting it out closer to 4%. You've got a little bit of a buffer. Anything over 4%, closer to 5% is what I would consider a real high yield today. And I know... That doesn't sound overly exciting compared to past performance of real estate. Again, I was buying yields at 6% in Sydney, um, and today those yields have improved. And obviously, my, you know, compared to the debt I have on those properties, they are positive cash flow. And again, this is something we need to factor in. Over time, we want our portfolio to end up positive cash flow but we need to factor in the real cost of money, which includes how much we pay to borrow it. So, uh, so fascinating today. I think over four percent, closer to five percent, is a really strong high level of return. Obviously, obviously, even some markets do even better than that. I recently put together some seven percent yields for my customers, um, and they, you know, they are being paid to own the real estate through what is known as positive cash flow. If the interest rate was to go up to 7%, they're still renting the property for 7%. Think about the risk profile of that asset, that it is a shock absorber property for any future movement. Now, remember, for the most part, if interest rates go up, you can pass on that cost to your tenant. But you need a tenant that has a good income profile to be able to pass it on to. This is why I tend to steer clear of tenants that are kind of half a week away from broke in lower socioeconomic areas. What is sometimes known in real estate as the rent to income ratio? 
uh, is really, really important for the future footprint of real estate. The fact that we are at a low cash rate today, to know we're in the right direction, we want to be able to get tenants which have a pretty good income profile so that we can potentially charge them more rent into the future should the inflation change in the real estate marketplace. So if you're already getting 4 or 5% yield, you're probably getting a pretty good rental return today um, based on, you know, what real estate costs today if you went out and bought it. But one way to analyze tenants, and this is what property managers tend to do a fair bit, is come up with what is known as a rent to income ratio. Basically, what is considered to be a bit of a formula is that tenants shouldn't pay um, any more than 30% of their income in rent. So let's say Bob's earning $100,000 he can afford $30,000 in rent and that would leave him $70,000 to go and run the rest of Bob's life. Obviously, there's tax in there as well, right? But uh, the lower the rent to income ratio, basically, the more ability you have to put up your rent. So let's say Bob is earning $100,000 and paying $20,000 in rent, well, he's actually got a lot more flexibility to pay more rent to you. So again, um, even with my property managers, we try and look for a 25% rent to income ratio so that we know that those uh, real estate tenants we're attracting, there is a buffer to actually pass on some of the cost to run real estate to them. Remember, knowing we're on the right track is knowing we uh, can make real estate work from our wage, from tax returns or depreciation and the tenant. We really want the tenant to do the lion's share of work here. And again, this is why I openly teach people that in a mega trend economy where inequality is real, it's one of the biggest mega trends around the world. We have seen all over the globe, I guess, uh, you know, uh, just that unfold with with certain countries around the world, a leader in inequality. That all of a sudden, you know, when you take into consideration running a household, uh, fuel, power, transport, clothing medical expenses, uh, recreation, you know, we want uh, a high level of disposable income from our tenants so that we are actually competing if we have to look after this real estate and, and defend it with alcohol. Why not? Why not take the other market share from what someone is spending typically weekly? This is what the battleground is in the future. Um, and again, for some people, they just, they just you know, they are literally spending their last buck at Coles and have no more money. And then they're going to work and getting the paycheck, paying the rent and going to Coles. And there's like this merry-go-round that if the cost of food goes up at Coles, where, who's going to suffer? What's going to potentially happen? Because it's either food or shelter. Again, um, some of these more discretionary items like recreation and alcohol and things like that, you know, uh, they can obviously be accounted for. And it's this kind of like, who is going to take market share? And it's an interesting way, I think, to look at if we're going in the right direction, that you have got a property in the right area to play this market share game of cash flow. And it really is, uh, you know, almost like a modern economy version of Monopoly. Now, obviously, if you know you're in the right direction, you've got Pi influencing your real estate. I'm not going to get into this uh, as a big one. Pi, of course, is population, infrastructure, and employment or jobs. Really, you want a, in a city and a local area where it's mission fit. And I talked about that in the last podcast. If you haven't listened to that podcast, go and listen to it again. Mission fit, diversified employment, great future jobs, skilled economy, smart economics. Hey, if you've got real estate in a city like that, 
There's nothing to worry about. You are going to wake up in 20, 30, 40, 50 years with a smile on your face. Obviously, uh, again, infrastructure is a big thing and the pipeline of infrastructure that potentially a city and a local area has is really, really important because it creates more jobs. It creates more economic stimulus and you really want that stuff full to the brim and obviously some of the better places in our country have full to the brim infrastructure and as such that is just you know the best possible thing you can get when it comes to more of a macro dynamic looking at your real estate and of course population is uh, a big big driver as to the result of real estate and of course we want a growing population we get that from really four different ways we get it from obviously natural births and natural deaths we get it from international migration we get it from interstate migration and we get it from spatial distribution, which I talked about last podcast, which is really the migration of people from one suburb to another suburb and how that drives the results of real estate. So again, if we can just make sure we own real estate in a overall economy, which is going to be driven by some results from international, interstate and localized migration, as well as a strong births, deaths, uh, concept, you're going to do really, really well. So what makes a good location? How do we know we're on the right track? What is a good location? I think we've all heard those words, location, location, location. How do we know we're on a, a trajectory of owning real estate in a good location? Well, look, I think you're just going to break it down to a few key variables, access to good jobs, access to good schools, Obviously, that creates a better family environment, access to good parks, beaches, and public amenity. This really does give people a great recreation environment, access to good transport, whether it's uh, active transport, like things like the ability to walk around, having a good walk score, or active transport, like things like cycling, or heavier transport, like things like rail, really does make a difference to the movement of people. And as such, the location score just gets better. I think areas which are geographically significant to how uh, a city functions is very important. This is, of course, where you see, for example, in Sydney, beachside suburbs are very expensive because beachside suburbs are a functionality dynamic within the city of Sydney. In other words, people love going to the beach in Sydney. People love going to the beach more in Sydney than they do in Melbourne. Uh, so geographically speaking, what is important to someone in Melbourne is completely different to what is important to someone in Sydney. And as such, it is a really good idea to understand localized ge geography to understand what people like. Obviously, I think the overall look and feel of a area is really does impact on the location score of an area. You know, if it's got good landscaping, good treescaping, if people are house proud, um, it is so important. If it's got a great cityscape, all of a sudden that area is going to continue to be improved. And of course, a lot of that improvement will come with citizens looking to achieve a higher social status in that neighborhood, driving up the potential opportunity for more growth. And again, if you're holding real estate right now or you own real estate right now, or you're buying real estate right now, you know, real estate which are in suburbs, which are appealing, obviously um, is going to be so important to the way you assess real estate over the longer term. Obviously, some of the simple things you can do is look at online searches and you'll see if a real estate is in high demand, medium demand, low demand, um, based on what other people think of that particular area at this point in time. That can fluctuate, but, you know, for the most part, you know, good locations get a good medium to high to, you know, really, really high demand uh, continuously over the different cycles which affect real estate. Obviously, I think this is a real key indicator that you're going in the right direction, that you often have just a very good continuous level of interest of people wanting to buy in that neighborhood and people who really do think that overall it is a good pocket of town. 
Uh, obviously, real estate is niche, and I did touch on this before that, you know, there are better streets in suburbs, and as such, you know, it's just really, really good as well to start to understand how the local environment works as much as anything else. What locals prefer as the best street, the worst street, and the middle streets. Uh, there is no right or wrong, by the way. It's just actually starting to determine the data, making sure that you're um, owning real estate and you're comprehending what you're actually owning. And it might be that you own real estate in the worst street of a gun suburb, but that's okay because if you're monitoring the market, you might be able to see that the gun street in the gun suburb just skyrocketed in value and eventually that'll come to you. And these are some of the ways to train yourself to know you're going in the right direction when it comes to real estate ownership. Obviously, how you invest in real estate is really highly dependent upon you. And I said this in the beginning that, you know, sometimes people uh, enter the real estate marketplace when the real estate marketplace is quite quiet. And the reason they do that is because they are actually financially ready to get going. Sometimes when someone is financially ready to get going and where the real estate market is, is two worlds apart. And as such, you know, I always just keep it simple because I think one of the biggest things to uh, tackle when it comes to investment is where you are in your life. Um, if you're ready to go and the market's not ready, that's just the reality of life. And you just have to suck it up and get into it and make the best of a situation. And of course, when the market is soft, you know, quite often you get some really good deals anyway. But it is obviously a dynamic when it comes to investment. It is highly dependent upon the investor. Now, when you think about who puts money into the real estate market? You've got all sorts of different people. You've got really rich people. You've got people who are all cash that do not need loans. Do you think someone who's all cash who does not need a loan potentially can drive a harder bargain than someone who needs six finance extensions and needs to, you know, team up with a friend to borrow money? All of a sudden, uh, there is a level of an unequal playing field in real estate. You often see this in the rate of return of growth. Again, all cash people will probably get a better return on their investment in the short term than potentially someone who needs four or five finance extensions who's literally struggling to, to make uh, a deposit stack up to even get a hold of real estate. So a lot of things depend on you, your age, your profile, your job, your cash flow, your deposit, your buying power, your risk profile. Are you a high risk person, a low risk person? Uh, are you willing to, you know, take a high risk, high reward strategy? Or are you actually needing something which is a little bit more sensible because of where you are in your life? Uh, your starting profile, what you can actually borrow. All of this impacts really the asset allocation you often get subject to in real estate. And again, I think sometimes this meddles with people's mojo, particularly in boom, in a boom period. And, uh, you know, I recently did a Emotions of the Real Estate podcast. I don't know, I think it's podcast 52 or 53. Go and listen to that if you haven't listened to that episode because it really will teach you some of the different behavioral dynamics human beings go through when it comes to owning real estate or buying real estate or the real estate marketplace. So uh, it will sort of help you understand that we go through different elements as human beings and real estate, again, is a game of psychology and knowing you're in the going in the right direction really can be a game of psychology more than the real estate marketplace. I always say this, real estate is reliable, people are not. So I think it's a, it's a really good episode if you haven't picked up on that episode yet. If so, if not, go back, go back uh, and, uh, and go and have a listen. So real estate marketplaces all behave differently. And 
not all real estate will go up the same rate. And I think it's fair to say, you know, sometimes when we get these reports that, you know, Brisbane's going to do 20% or Sydney's going to do 20% growth or Sydney's going to go down by 20%, um, all of a sudden we factor that macro logic into what we own or potentially what we're going to buy. And it doesn't really work like that. And I'll explain first, and I've explained this before, the four forms of money inside the real estate community. I like to link it, the money to assets and asset allocation. The first asset allocation is the discretionary or prestige marketplace. Right now, the prestige marketplace is booming. Uh, $5 million houses are selling for $8 million. And all of, that, all of a sudden, that 30, 35% growth rate is, again, at a macro level when the data is pulled, spread across all of Sydney. But fundamentally, not every property in Sydney is getting a million dollar uplift whatsoever. That's not what is unfolding. Aspirational properties, which are kind of those that real estate, you know, typically from like $900,000 to $2 million is again doing doing well because people today are upgrading their spatial change and quite often that real estate is being a beneficiary of it. Where most real estate agents, are, sorry, most real estate investors buy is the affordable section. Most people I deal with are not all cash and unable to buy in aspirational marketplaces. They are people who are building a portfolio which where the, by the yield pays for the debt of the asset. And as such, they are steering clear of $1 million, $2 million properties which have a low yield. Um, and as such, they are buying what I would refer to as affordable properties. Most people I help are spending three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars. A very affordable range of real estate. And I think really the best range of real estate for people to get diverse capital into the marketplace. Because when you're shopping at that range, you're getting the rents to do the work for you. You're not needing your job to do the work for you. And if you're using a medium to high cash flow yield strategy, you're really, really controlling uh, capital in the market using other people's money, using your tenant's money, which is so critical to this thing called wealth creation. The cool thing about affordable real estate is you really want the social status of that affordable real estate to improve. So it eventually becomes aspirational. Once upon a time, aspirational real estate was affordable. And uh, obviously it's transformed and become somewhere where people aspire to get to. What our job is as real estate investors is to buy real estate in the affordable section of the market and make sure it becomes aspirational and it can happen quickly or it can happen a little bit slower. And I'll talk to you about really the different types of locations that transform at different rates inside the market itself. The final place where money is put in the real estate market is this inequality pocket of the marketplace. This is where, again, these Gopnik villages where there is high crime rate and uh, Gopnik dogs, you probably, again, aren't just going to get this huge transformation overnight of wealth because the social status of those areas is questionable. In the past, that has not been the case. Some of those lower socioeconomic zones have gone up as a beneficiary of the overall transformation of economics. But I think into the future, certainly after this surge, there is going to be a real, uh, real daylight between what will improve from a location performance and capital growth performance into the future. I certainly think the future capital growth is going to be more at a niche level and hence why I like to teach niche investment strategies around real estate. Now, obviously, real estate markets rise. I'm going to leave you with this. My simple three-tick system when it comes to knowing you have bought or are holding the right property. Good improvements or a good asset 
Bad economics, in other words, a bad place to own real estate, is a bad decision in my book. Bad improvements, in other words, the wrong asset in a good economy, is still a bad decision in my view. However, a good asset, the right property, and a good economy is a really good decision in my view. And I think really needs to be as simple as that real estate. Make sure you're owning the right properties that you know what they're designed to do. Make sure you understand the marketplace you're in and what it is trying to achieve. Every suburb is different in our cities and every suburb has a different capital growth rate. And quite often, because real estate is so niche at a street level, Every street will have a different level of performance in real estate. Hey, I hope that was helpful and I hope you're going in the right direction when it comes to real estate. Hey, this was a brutally long show. I hope you stuck it out. My God, I hope you paid it in double time. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. I will catch you next week on another fun-filled episode. And maybe if you're watching on YouTube, you'll meet Rafi, the Gopnik dog. Thanks for tuning in to the Urban Property Investor. To never miss an episode, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app or on YouTube. And I would love it if you could give the show a rating and share it with your friends and family. In between episodes, you can always keep in touch with me by connecting on social media over Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. Until we meet again on the next episode of the Urban Property Investor, take care and bye for now.